Nightmares. I'm your host, Clark Wolf. It's so nice to see you. Thank you for joining us. Boy, we have so many horror, scary, goodness newses today. Mm. Uh, but before we dive right into our newses, uh, to my left, let me introduce my panel, Miss Perry Nemiroff. Hi, guys. I'm so excited. Wait, no, the other way. Look what's on the list. Am I... Amer- yeah. American Horror Story. That was way too difficult for me to do to point right. an American Horror Story. It was, story. as promised, I'm so American excited, Horror Story. And to her left is Mr. John Schnepp. <laughs> Wait, the other way. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't see that this week, so I can't talk about it. But so happy to be here for the newses. <laughs> for the newses. <laughs> and to my right is Mr. Mark Riley. You guys are funny. <laughs> I like you a lot. <laughs> I'm playing with a doll. I'm playing with Annabelle yeah. over here. Look at me. We also, we've got our own little friend Precious is here. Right. Do you see Precious? Precious, Precious. is tired. Precious and I have a very weird relationship. I'm, not, I'm just going well, to put it at that. That's what happens when you pull people's noses off. That's well, he deserved it. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll get to that later. But first, let's get to our news. As we had some uh, breaking news happen right before we started recording our show, the trailer for Phantasm Ravager has finally hit yes. Entertainment yes. Weekly. Phantasm yes. Look at the ball. Just nuts. Look at it. Boy. Um, so we watched the trailer right before we started recording, and uh, it looks crazy and bonkers and kind of awesome. Riley, you had a pretty good reaction to this. Yeah, I can't say what my reaction was on air here because I. I I believe I said this is bat you know what crazy and I'm mm. in I, yeah. lo- I love it's phantasm it's it looks like it's just a, a fitting end of the chapter like let's just go full-on apocalyptic Mad Max zombie whatever is going on in this with the tall man I just can't wait so. yeah and Schnepp you've got your tickets for Beyond Fest for yes. the big screening here in Los Angeles yeah you know October 1st they're showing the original 1979 phantasm that JJ Abrams company Bad Robot restored yeah. in 4K. So I'm like, I'm going to see it like no one else has ever seen it. I guess they're putting it out on Blu-ray in 4K. So excited to see the original. And then the final chapter directed by a cool pal, uh, talented David Hartman and written by the original guy, Don Coscarelli. I don't know how they're going to wrap it up, but I'm glad that they did. And I'm glad they got Angus Scrim before he passed away yep. to finish his role as the tall man. They got giant spheres blowing up buildings. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm excited to see it, though. Reggie, Re- Reggie Bannister is back. And um, Perry, how about you? Are you on board of with this adventure? Of course I'm on board. How can you not like Phantasm and not be hyped about this trailer? This is absolutely insane. And I'm a little surprised by myself that I didn't expect them to go to such levels. But this is just absolutely above and beyond anything I was expecting to see in this trailer right yeah it looks like it's gonna be a lot of fun so we'll obviously uh keep you informed as to you know um like the movie you can find it on vod in the next couple of weeks i think before before it hits theaters is that right it says we'll be available to watch via digital hd and vod before the the pair as in the two movies uh come into theaters on october 7th awesome so stay tuned we'll get a review some way somehow even if it's not a full review we'll all see it and we'll talk about it so stay tuned for more news on uh, Phantasm Ravager. And now let's get into our fresh meat. (laughs) So many sweaty trailers, you guys. We have all the trailers today. Um, So first up, last week we saw the first look at Lights Out director David F. Sandberg's latest film, Annabelle 2. A brief synopsis states several years after the tragic death of their little girl, a doll maker and his wife welcome a nun and several girls from a shuttered orphanage into their home, soon becoming the target of the doll maker's possessed creation, Annabelle. I wonder if the doll is or the nun is Valak. Mm. Mm. Yep. Both Warner Brothers and Sandberg appear to have major confidence in the film. As the director told Bloody Disgusting back in June, I don't think I can give too many details at this point, but it's not a continuation of the first film. That's one of the many things that enticed me with this project, that it's a new story. Also, the setting and the time period of this one is perfect for a horror movie. The script is really good, and I think that this is a sequel that will actually be better than the original, not going to be hard. The Godfather 2 of creepy doll movies, as I like to call it. High <laughs> praise from Sandberg. Annabelle 2 is looking to cash in on scary summer dollars and is slated to hit theaters on May 19th, 2017. But coming to theaters a little sooner is The Bye Bye Man from Oscar-nominated director Stacy Title. When three college friends stumble upon the horrific origins of The Bye Bye Man, they discover that there is only one way to avoid his curse. Don't say it. Don't think it. But once The Bye Bye Man, played by Doug Jones, gets in 
inside your head, he takes control. Is there a way to survive his possession? We find out on January 13th, 2017. So guys, this has been a really great year for studio horror. I think we've all talked about that um, over the last couple of months. And it looks like could 2017 be a continuation of that? Perry, I'm going to start with you. I am pleasantly surprised by the Annabelle trailer. I did a reaction with Riley, and I'm pretty sure you could see it all over, well, my face at least, because I, I don't know how you feel about the first Annabelle, but I was very disappointed by the first Annabelle. I, I mean, strong dislike, just because The Conjuring, when it came out, was my number one movie. I believe it was of 2013, and I thought it was just so brilliant what they did with Annabelle in the beginning as the cold open, and that was perfect. And then the, the mythology they came up with in the other movie was just I mean, it was garbage. It was not what I wanted mm. at all. The doll was not scary anymore. I don't know what they were thinking. This was such a pleasant surprise. I mean, good on them for just, I mean, obviously it's a teaser, so I guess we could have predicted getting this type of teaser, but good on them for keeping it nice and simple, focusing on that one scare, the one like body crack. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you focus on one thing like that and you're not throwing something at everybody's faces, Mm -hmm. that one thing will end up being 10 times more scary. And that's the case. And it introduces something new into the mythology. Like what, what is the backstory of Annabelle? Who is that girl and the doll? How did they correlate? Who was she talking to? I just love all those ideas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the an, the mythology for Annabelle, I think, is rather convoluted when you look at the first film. Is it a demon? Is it a possession? Does the demon attach to the doll and possess a person? But then there was the cult thing. It's very confusing and weird. Um, Schnapp, how about you, Annabelle? But also the Bye Bye Man was the new trailer. Uh, yeah. How did you find these two trailers? Well, for me, I I prefer to not even think about Annabelle because <laughs> I, I didn't even see it. Everyone, every one of my friends who who saw it said it was horrible, and and so. The mythology doesn't matter to me. I'm probably never going to see it, but I am going to see The Empire Strikes Back of <laughs> creepy doll movies. Annabelle, too, because I love this trailer. I love that you didn't see what was making all the crickety crackety sounds. Like that was just watching her react to the crackly weird. And it's not the doll making the cracks, it's the girl. So it automatically had a creepy vibe to it. So I'm in 100%. I don't care what the other original movie was anymore. This could be my first Annabelle. And uh, yeah, the Bye Bye Man, I, you know, Stacy's a good friend. So it's like I, the trailers, I was like, you know, always try to be like, hey, look, you know, love you as a person. This trailer better be scary. And the Buy My Man trailer is scary and it does its job. You know, creepy Doug Jones walking around, coming out of the shadows with a broken finger or whatever he is. I don't even know what he is, but I, I felt like a combination of Final Destination yeah. meets like something like Candyman. Yeah, so it really totally. did feel like this kind of cool blending of like, you know, the, oh, if you do this, you can't reverse time because this other thing will happen. And, you know, this guy just kind of shows up in the worst possible times to mess your whole life up. And then you probably die. I don't really know, <laughs> but I'm looking forward to it. I, you know, it's interesting that they've moved it twice. Mm-hmm. That's kind of disturbing. But I think January 13th is a good date. Absolutely. I think, you know, we've talked about it on this show before. You used to be January, February were considered dumping grounds, right? You put movies there that meh, maybe you don't have so much confidence on. But now, I mean, especially when it comes to horror, you're seeing genre movies clean up in January and February. They're making tons of money. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad. It's just an open release date. You know, all these release dates are so saturated now. So I actually don't have too much trepidation when it comes to the moving of that mm. uh, of the date but I'm loving uh, Riley and I'd love to get your thoughts on this the the in- invention of a new mythological bad guy and the bye bye man right I mean it feels like a very original property maybe with elements that we've seen before of course but I kind of love the idea of a new creature because I certainly had never heard of the bye bye man before it's almost like a boogeyman yeah kind of kind of thing but what are your take on these two well trailers? I also got a sinister vibe from it totally um, which I liked uh, and there was a great the, the maggot coming out of the eye bit <laughs> I was just like yeah okay I'll, I like that um I think it's an interesting title as well. I like the Bye Bye Man as a title for a horror movie, a bad guy, a boogeyman like uh, Candyman, all this that mm-hmm. everybody's talked about. So I'm interested in this. I, I wasn't blown away by the trailer by any means. I was like, okay, for me, it felt a little too much like I've already seen this. I did get the Sinister vibes. I did get a little Candyman. I did get, I, I see your Final Destination reference. So, but because of the trailer, because everybody speaks highly of the director, you know, I'm. it's a horror movie, so I'm gonna see it. Um, as far as the Godfather two <laughs> of uh, trailers, <laughs> creepy, which would, creepy doll movies, creepy doll movies, which would mean Annabelle is the Godfather. No, 
<laughs> magic is the godfather. No, that Anthony magic, is not. Is magic is totally is the godfather. The it's not. Uh, I, I will go on record. I thought Annabelle wasn't as bad as everybody says. Mm-hmm. I thought there were some really great scary moments and it just didn't hold together too well. But this, if you want to know, if you want a spoiler alert of my reaction to that trailer, <laughs> this was me the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> You don't even that, have to watch it. There's some great screen grabs of your face. When I know he, when everybody the crack on Thank happens. You Twitter for uh, making sure that that face lives forever <laughs> on the internet. Um, it was yeah. It <laughs> we were watching it. Excuse me, and uh, my my face just was like oh because that's what that crickety crack did. And oh, I was nice. like oh god, and I love that. Once you read the synopsis and they were like, okay, a doll maker makes Annabelle, that clicked in my head, yeah. finally. Because why are people carrying around this creepy looking doll? The fact that it's made maybe a while ago, a long mm-hmm. time ago by a doll maker makes a lot of sense. And for me, I could put two and two together going, well, this is cool. It's like a cool old doll for my collection. Mm-hmm. Cause it was always bothering me why this doll was ending up in people's houses. It made no, after a, after a satanic cult lady bleeds all over your doll, guess what? That doll goes in the trash. <laughs> yeah, no, you can throw it I'm away. sorry. Personally burned. It was insanity. This first, I'm sorry, I could go on. Anyway. No, and, and, and moreover, I'm not going to pick up that doll no matter where it is. It's sitting on the ground. I am leaving it on the ground. So this that is like, thing is, is ugly as sin. Is this like a Chucky situation? No, where there's like multiple the Annabelles? So I wanna, no. Or is it like I, a Hellraiser bloodlines? Like I've made this very special <laughs> Only one of them. <laughs> you know, it's convoluted, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but but you know, Annabelle, the first movie, is really not a creepy doll movie in the vein of Chucky. The doll really doesn't do much. Mm. They present no. the doll um, in kind of like with, uh, you, so they mention it in The Conjuring, whereas they say, well, the doll isn't possessed, but there's a demon that's attached to the doll. Exactly. And it's the demon mm. that's doing all this stuff. So really and truly, Annabelle the doll doesn't do a whole lot of anything in the first movie unless I'm, um, cor- please correct me if I'm wrong, unless I'm remembering Now it wrong. hovers yeah, sometimes. I mean, she's there. But, but, it's, but yeah, it Her floats because the demon, shift. the demon's but, like holding demon. it. Oh, okay. so The demon's like kind of holding it up and you can see the kind of the shadows, which is what I liked about that movie with some of the shots. Because yep. the demon, this weird looking thing is like kind of holding it and then it like drops. So there's some cool moments like but that. But then there's a cult lady too and it's like, this doesn't make any sense. It didn't Those make characters a lot of sense. were all awful. Yeah, yeah. but so, <laughs> I love how we're also. <laughs> Harry just went off into a, I mean, another yeah. realm. She's, she's I want to see the movie right, Cult though. Lady Two. Yeah, like, don't oh, even make God. the first one; just make a sequel. Um, so we'll we'll you know we'll okay. So we're all not the biggest fans of Annabelle the first one. Some less and more than others. Yeah. But um, it looks like we are all find this first teaser promising. And I actually yeah. am looking forward to seeing a real trailer for this movie. Me um, too. I think it's also important to note that uh, Annabelle two reunites uh, David Sandberg with several of his Lights Out uh, collaborators. The production designer I believe worked with him on Lights Out, as did um, another key figure. Awesome. So you know it's it's got the makings of something that could be pretty great so good we've got some promising trailers yeah. it's very exciting um let's go ahead and move on everything that's old is new again and if mad max can get an academy award winning sequel reboot whatever it was then damn it so can reanimator and toxic avenger okay <laughs> so maybe not oscars <laughs> in the future for those two but those two cult classics are looking to get the reboot treatment bloody disgusting did some digging and found that reanimator evolution is still in active development with Sarah J. Levin at the helm, working from a script that he co-wrote with Jonathan, Jonathan Sheck, who will be portraying Herbert West in the new version. The confirmed cast also includes Lynn Shea and Brad Dourif. Levin previewed the new movie to Bloody Disgusting, saying, Our adaptation is a modern rendition of Herbert West, reanimator by H.P. Lovecraft. Moreover, we're making sure the spirit and the story elements are more loyal to the original written material of H.P. Lovecraft. It's much darker, more thought-provoking, and definitely more grounded in science than the first adaptation. It will be a true horror film with some neat sci-fi layers. And let's not forget about Toxic Avenger, which is coming back to the big screen courtesy of of Sausage Party co-director Conrad Vernon. Deadline notes that Toxic Avenger is a reimagining of Troma's cl- cult classic, which tells the story of a New Jersey teenager whose accidental tumble into a vat of toxic waste turns him into a mutant superhero. Vernon shared his enthusiasm for the property, saying the opportunity to reimagine a favorite cult classic from my high school years is an honor. Toxie is an underground icon, my favorite kind. Okay, so, you know, look, guys, I mean, I think we've all stopped 
stop fighting the remake, reboot, reimagining battle. At this point, what can you do? It's all inevitable. But I do think that what we're seeing are people who are true fans of the original material who are actually being given budgets mm -hmm. to maybe do something. Now, that might be more so on the Toxic Avenger side than the reanimator side. But, Schnapp, I'm going to put it to you. You know, when, when creators and filmmakers are tasked <laughs> to reimagine cult classics, sure. so we're not even talking about these, you know, big movies of a certain time. Right. These are these are underground, gritty, uh, underappreciated films. Are, are, do you as a fan look at this and go, okay, cool? Or does it give you some sort of trepidation? I think a little bit of both. I mean, with something like Reanimator, it's a great film. It's uh, it's it's uh, it's got its due. If you have never seen Reanimator the musical, so how good. much fun, and you get sprayed <laughs> with blood. But uh, and it's really well done music. So I think uh, you know Stuart Gordon and Brian Yuzda and those guys when they were making those films and made From Beyond, they did a lot of really cool, fun H.P. Lovecraft films. Uh, I gotta say, it's time to make a re a reboot or remake, um, and maybe not do a uh, not a sequel. It's a straight up reboot. We're taking Reanimator, like they're saying. We're going more with H.P. Lovecraft's written material. I kind of always like laugh when I hear somebody. We're more grounded in science. <laughs> oh, you mean bringing back the dead? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, or from another dimension, the science. Uh, so you know. Uh, but I get what he's saying. He's saying we're going to be a little more faithful to the material and not maybe as like big as some of the other, especially like Beyond Reanimator and some of the later Reanimator sequels got. So that's exciting me. Toxic Avenger, you can do no wrong. Uh, you know, obviously, as the Toxic Avenger kept making more and more of the sequels, they got cheaper and go goofier. <laughs> and he even had, a, I don't know if you remember, the animated series Toxic Avenger. I mean, oh, yeah. he's gone through a lot of incarnations. <laughs> so it's fun to, to have someone who actually grew up with Toxic Avenger, loved it, and he's going to bring some flavor to it. But, you know, stuff that he wants with a little bit of a bigger budget, I'm sure it'll be really fun. So I'm happy to see both of them getting remade. Now, Perry, you and I have both seen uh, Sausage Party. Yes. You and I both love Sausage Party. Very much. And that, to me, was just like the coolest pairing. Was like, oh my God, the sensibility of, and the really dark, twisted sense of humor of Sausage Party with Toxic Avenger. I was like, that kind of sounds amazing. I love the sound of that. That's why I'm probably a little more excited about the Toxic, toxic Avenger news than I am about Reanimator because in the Reanimator piece they present them as though they're well-known filmmakers or, or rising horror stars and I'm not particularly aware of those two guys sure. but but the guy who directed uh, co-directed Sausage Party mm -hmm. is that what it is yeah. um, the idea of him taking on Toxic Avenger is very appealing to me I have seen Toxic Avenger and I've seen quite a few trauma movies. They're not really for me. So as someone who isn't really into that kind of movie, that shows that it's time to do another one because it's still a great character and I could mm -hmm. still have fun with some of it. But could you imagine going up to like a random, like a teenager now and be like, watch this movie. You're going to get it just like I did. I don't, I don't know if that's possible anymore. So it, it is about time for a remake. And with the reanimator thing, the grounded joke, I get it, but I totally buy into that. The thought of getting, I think, darker, thought-provoking, and grounded reanimator, yeah, I see a lot of potential in that, and I do want to see it, even though I'm not really aware of what these guys have done before. Sure. Sure. Okay, Riley, how about you? Where do you stand on these guys? Well, first off, th these graphics here bring me back to wandering around the video store there on 17th Street where I grew up, right next to Mervyn's. That was so much fun. Like, this is great. This, I, like, I grabbed the Toxic, uh, Toxic Avenger based on the cover and went, Dad, Dad, and he was like, what the hell? And we went and watched it, and it was ridiculous and awful and so much fun. And so... Uh, uh, a remake sounds great. I mean, I think we could do it, especially if you have the Sausage Party uh, guy. I, I haven't seen the movie, but I can assume that he's uh, got a dirty mind and a dirty mouth and a, a dirty <laughs> what wit. What so think that? I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's because there was a sausage hanging on the side of the Coming Soon posters for like a month. <laughs> yeah. on a, a dick on, back. I know. Like, yeah, <laughs> where everybody had a sausage, a, a sausage the in their ear head. or eye or whatever. So... I, I think because of the humor and the ridiculousness of the original, I think that that will transfer well with this. So I'm interested. So uh, with Reanimator, I love that we got uh, that thing you do, Jonathan Check coming so in. Here's that 
that's the <laughs> only thing I and had known him from. I know him from that. I, I know he's in movie. the Day of the Dead remake, um, and he's playing uh, one of the fa- who's the zombie uh, guy that's bub, the big bub, but not yeah. bub, but like other bub, which he's we like talked the about on Nightmares a couple of yeah weeks right. ago. That's right. And I love that he he's getting he's he's a horror lover. You can tell he's he's co-writing this thing. So a grounded one. I I echo what you say, Perry. A grounded one sounds like a good idea to me. Is there I, I, room it just does. For a Jeffrey Combs uh, little mm. cameo? So, Absolutely. Uh, in the in the article, Bloody said that they were not currently attached, so Jeffrey Combs would not be uh, is currently attached and uh, Stuart Gordon is not currently involved, mm. but the article did go out of its way to point out that just because they're so far early in the stages sure. that that doesn't mean that they could not eventually become involved, which is kind of promising. Yeah, I think a cameo is is in order. I mean, they they always do it, you know, right. for Movies like this for remakes, you know, they're going to bring in the actor that kind of started it all. And you I want to we'll see, see Lloyd Kaufman's head ripped off in the new Jurassic <laughs> <Right. Topic> Avenger. <laughs> I'm sure that that I'm sure that could probably be arranged. Um, all right. So next up, Adam Scott has apparently been bitten by the horror comedy bug after starring in the box office hit Krampus last winter. Earlier this year, it was announced that he would team with Craig Robinson for Ghosted, which was described as a single camera comedic X Files for Fox. And this week, the Hollywood Reporter reported uh, report. Uh, yeah, well, that makes sense. <laughs> that Scott would join Evangeline Lilly. In the second feature from Tucker and Dale vs. Evil dire- writer-director Eli Craig. According to THR, Little Evil, which is the title, follows Gary, played by Scott, who just married Samantha, played by Lily, only to find out that her six-year-old son is the Antichrist. Little Evil is slated to hit Netflix as an original movie in 2017. Riley, I know you love you some Adam Scott, I and um, this pairing just sounds so, so great. And gosh, what has taken Tucker and Dale's uh, uh, Eli Craig so long. That that's that's the big takeaway for me. Not a, to take Eli Craig and I love Tucker and Dale versus Evil, and then pair him up with Adam Scott, one of my favorites. Um, this sounds so much fun. I can just picture him. He is the 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 straight guy in a comedy ver- to, to this Antichrist. I just picture his dry reaction to whatever this kid is going to do. It's a perfect title. It sounds so much fun. I love Aunt Evangeline Lilly. So this this is a great pairing. I can't wait. And Perry, you know, um, obviously, and what's so cool about Netflix is that I, you know, they have access to all of this information, right? They know what people are watching on their service. And Tucker and Dale. I know so many people that have found Tucker and Dale on Netflix. It's been on instant streaming for a long time. So I think this pairing makes good sense, right? I th- Not that I don't like everybody involved, because I'm a huge fan of Adam Scott. I love Tucker and Dale versus Evil. The fact that it's a Netflix show is what's making me really hopeful, because if you had just read me the log line, even though it's got the comedy spin, I still would have been like, yeah, all right. I- I've heard that a million times before. The comedy has to be really on point to make that work. But the fact that this is going to live on Netflix and has that kind of flexibility, whereas you know somewhere else it might not, I feel like it could work. I'm not 100% sold. I'm a little bit of a tough sell when it comes to horror comedies in general. There's very few that really, you know, get me and make me want to watch them over and over. Tucker Tucker and Dale versus Evil happens to be one of them, so... I am hopeful. I'm a little skeptical, though. Well, I think it's cool. You know, Netflix is so well known for their shows, but obviously they're really getting into feature films, and I think they're trying to do more um, horror content and interesting content. So, Schnepp, are you know, are you excited by the promise of Eli Craig plus Adam Scott plus Netflix? I am, and Evangeline Lilly. Yeah, of I course, think she's a great actress. So I think uh, you know. When I first heard about this, I was kind of hoping it would be a series. Yeah. Because in my mind, it's like Richie Rich and like, what's that little devil character? Was it Lil Devil or whatever? It's like, oh, yeah. it feels like, you know, that little evil sounds like a television series. So, but that it's a standalone one off, that's cool with me too. I like the combination. Yeah, Adam Scott, I think he's found his, uh, he's digging doing the horror films. So why not? You know, I mean, Ghosted sounds hilarious too. So, yeah. Uh, and I'll be checking both of these out on Netflix. I love it. I love it. All right, kids. Well, let's. Let's move on to our next segment. Uh, you all know it and love it. What, it's what is called, it? What is it called? What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? What is it? Brad Pitt's <laughs> marriage. Oh. oh. Snap. 
kids These are not in the box. <laughs> I, I hear he deserves it. I hear he deserves it. <laughs> All Bam. right. All right, kiddies. Last week, American Horror Story premiered <laughs> with a riff on reality television, American history, classic horror movie tropes, and an Oscar winner. We now know American Horror Story Roanoke, which stars Cuba Gooding Jr., Sarah Paulson, Angela Bassett, Kathy Bates, Dennis O'Hare, and Lady Gaga, has kicked off its sixth season with a pretty solid premiere. Um, and I think it's worth noting that this season will be short this year. It will be only 10 episodes that will conclude before Thanksgiving. All right, so most of us watched. Um, Shep's going to join us next week, mm -hmm. I'm sure. But, um, you know, uh, this was... Here's the question I'm going to pose to you first, Perry. Did the secrecy yeah, I knew this pay was off? <laughs> I am, I'm going to say no. Ooh. I don't think that made any difference to me. It just, I mean, it still aggravated me, even though there's tons of, uh, I guess, theories, but I, I guess it's more factual at this point, where people have connected almost every single teaser to something that happened in the premiere episode, which... I guess is kind of cool. I still think it was a big obnoxious marketing ploy that really upset me as someone who was very excited to find out the theme, you know? And I was a little bothered by the fact that this uh, this episode didn't have the traditional the American Horror Story credits. Cause oh, it didn't? No. no. And that's such a big deal. It's like, even though maybe certain episodes aren't as memorable, I feel like the season as a whole, I can picture every single season credit I just love the, the art that goes into that, but I, I don't like what they did. I still don't like what they did. I feel like if they were going to go this route and they wanted it to be a big fat mystery, all they had to do was just not give us the theme. But then again, now I'm going to backtrack. How were they going to promote it otherwise? But I, I still don't like it. I don't think it enhanced the episode whatsoever, but... I still do like what it ended up being, although I guess it's not straightforward with what it's going to be from here on out, which right. is a little confusing. Well, it, it is listed on the social media accounts as American Horror Story Roanoke. So even though there is this reality television element for my Roanoke nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, so basically the basic premise is we're seeing a reenactment, mm -hmm. right? Andre Holland is the real Matt and Lily Rabe is the real Sarah Paulson, I forget her name, I'm sorry. But she, so those are the real people. They're sitting in confessional style, reality TV reenactment. They're explaining what happened. And then we see Sarah Paulson and Cuba Gooding Jr. reenacting or doing the actual events of what it is. And that's the whole episode so far. So now, I feel like though the format is still kind of up for grabs. Something mm -hmm. tells me that we are not going to be stuck to this all season. Riley, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, to, to speak about the, the marketing campaign, mm -hmm. um, um, I, as you know, I only saw the first season, then they all left me, and I was like, leading up to this, we talked about it. I understand people's frustrations with it. I was getting there, too, just being like, I know, I don't know what's going on, but I didn't really care that much, to be honest with you. I was like, yeah, I'm going to check it out. But then the day shows up, and I realized I was in. I'm like, I have to watch this. This is must-see TV for me right now. I need to find out what everybody's talking about. I got swept up on the hype, and I got to tell you, it was really fun to kind of just let myself go and be like, all right. I'm making a date with my TV tonight. I'm putting this on and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I love the reenactment. I love that they did it this way. Maybe it's because pretty much every night before I go to bed, I watch these true crime series where they do the reenactment. So I love that premise. And to see it go into this with the kind of, there's something ghostly going on. I like the you watch that before you go to bed. I, it's weird, I know. I mean, it's, you know, I got a ghost in my house too, so whatever. Uh, but it, it, it just, it, it, it landed with me. And I like that. And I'm really interested. And inside that, I'm now, I'm sitting there watching the first episode going, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe they're all the teasers. Maybe they're going to do reenactments for all the teasers. Are we going to get an alien abduction kind of thing? Are we going to get this weird, you know, spider thing in the face thing? I don't know. So that's what's interesting to me. I don't know if they're going to go that, that route, but... It, there's possibility where now I have to, I can't wait for Wednesday. See, this is what I don't like, though, that we're still guessing. It's uncertain. It's like I'm, and I'm that's what I like, it. that now I'm must-see TV Wednesday. It's like, I haven't felt this this way about a show in a long time, actually. How many seasons of American Horror Story have you watched? One. So, this might be the difference, then, because yeah. like I'm such a hardcore fan where I've seen every single one. I and think I totally I'm so, get that. It's funny, because part of the reason I love this episode is because it deviates so much from past seasons, particularly in terms of format, but... 
I do like, you know, the coming home feeling of being within an American Horror Story theme that I can wrap my head around from day one. So as much as I love this premiere episode, I am a little frustrated by the fact that we are still talking about, oh, what if they do like the spider one next and right. whatnot? Well, I mean, we, we did see a preview for next week yeah. and we did see. So Kathy Bates character appears to be a ghost from maybe a settler or something like that. Um, but we did see glimpses of a continuation of this week's episode. Exactly. So. So th- that that brings up the question. I could be completely off. Is it just like three episodes to tell that particular story in Roanoke and then we move on? I don't know how they're going to do that. I get the frustration. I think I might be a little frustrated if they if it doesn't land correctly for me and then they move on to another story and it's not cohesive like the, the past seasons have been. So it's just interesting for me how uh, – it, 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 the idea of not knowing what to expect, even though we've had the first season, first episode, is is fascinating. Well, and I also think too, you know, one of the things that I liked that we did get was we got, you know, the things that I had sort of been wanting and saying out loud, like, look, this is what I want American Horror Story to do. We're in a small town. We were dealing with, um, you know, social issues with an interracial couple who is clearly not necessarily welcomed by the people in this small town. You're dealing with, um, you know, a family melodrama between the sister-in-law and her problems you're dealing you know there's a lot going on so um so we have that and uh and then you know of course we have the ghostly mystery and we have we have all of those elements as well um so i think that it's a promising start to the new season the cast looks incredible yeah and um yeah they're fantastic they were so good it's funny it's funny to me right now that I'm picking on the open endedness that this marketing campaign created because my favorite thing about this episode is how contained and focused it is, which is very, very unusual for any season of American Horror Story where you have a bajillion characters and there's like a creature in the basement here, but there's aliens over there. This is just focused on like a very human story. Yep within a family, within a house, and I just love the fact that I am so, I'm so into them and their relationship. The whole thing, it's not necessarily about the horror of the situation, even though that is highlighted, obviously. It's about who they are as people and what they went through and why they ended up in this place, and it makes it mean so much more. Yeah, that's what got me, and, and, and the fact that we have OJ and Marsha Clark getting I know, together, which was, so oh, I thought it was awesome, because, you know, and maybe it was a, a, a brilliant move by FX to get me in the people versus OJ, and then move right into this because I love the people versus OJ Simpson. So this was just so much fun. But yeah, I love the story on seeing what they went through and the, the kind of the tragedy that they went through, her losing the baby, and then they move out to this wherever, in a Roanoke, uh, in the middle of nowhere kind of place with the, you get the, the hills have eyes mm-hmm. feeling with the with the rednecks and the hillbillies. I it just got me and, and has anchored me. I just want to see more from it. And I, at first I was like, oh, are we going to get the whole season of this? Cool. I'm fine with that. But now I don't know. I am very curious to see if this format carries over. Yeah. yeah. Because you don't see any signs of it in the next episode preview. Right. Right? I don't think we see uh, Lily Rabe or... Or whoever plays Andre Holland. Yeah, yeah. Andre I think Holland. they're going to be around. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. they're going to be around for a little while. Uh, so we'll see. American Horror Story airs on FX on Wednesday nights. Did you guys have anything else you wanted to add before we move on? I want a title sequence next episode. I'm okay. going to be really disappointed if I don't get one. That's yeah. fair. That's fair and yeah. well deserved. I'd yeah. say. So nobody tried to guess the theme and win a Mercedes. Is that right? <laughs> Someone. Th- I didn't even know that was there. They I announced tried. the winner at the premiere right. episode. Yeah. Sure yeah. Somebody got a car. It oh wasn't boy. us. Well, they definitely um, made you know that that premiere episode was brought to you by Mercedes. I think it happened like four times throughout the episode. Yes. I know. Yeah, that's the other thing I took from it. All right, <laughs> moving on. Next up, Game of Thrones and Underworld Blood Wars actor Tobias Menzies has been cast in AMC's upcoming anthology series, The Terror, based on Dan Simmons' 2007 novel and produced by Ridley Scott. Deadline provided some additional insight into the series, explaining, written by feature uh, writer, Writer David Kagnich, uh, whose show runs with Sue Hugh. The series is set in 1847 when a Royal Navy expedition crew searching for the Northwest Passage is attacked by a mysterious predator.
predator that stalks the ships and their crew in a suspenseful and desperate game of survival. It is a fictional account of Captain Sir John Franklin's lost expedition of HMS Erubus and HMS Terror. Menzies leads a cast uh, leads the cast as a member of the Royal Navy. All right, so this sounds like a very high like high production value, yeah. high concept mm -hmm. anthology gamble in a way from AMC, but I kind of love it. Riley, uh, what are what did you hear? You know, you've got Ridley Scott, yeah. you've got this character actor who's been in a handful of things that we all enjoy, and you have this weird period military, you know, monster thing essentially. Yeah, creature stalking the ship. That's all I need. I'm a mm -hmm. huge fan of Leviathans in the Deep, so right. this this sounds interesting. Also, it's AMC, which I just have complete faith with every show they put in front of me. I, I, whether or not I, I, I stick with it, the production value, the story, the writers, the actors are all good, so AMC has a good record for me, so this sounds very fascinating. I like the idea. I don't know how they're gonna do the anthology, so I did a little research on the book itself, and the book, I uh, haven't read it, but it says from multiple different perspectives of the characters and the crew and how they interact with each other, so they might jump from character to character. I don't, I, if they say anthology, but yet in the log line there's a giant beast stalking the ship, what does that mean? So I'm intrigued, and you got Rid Ridley Scott, come on. So I'm, I'm very excited to see what this might turn out to be. All right, Schnepp, are you ready for this type of anthology series to make its way to AMC? Yeah, give me, give me, give me. <laughs> I, was, I was just thinking like, uh, Dear Diary, <laughs> April 18th, 1847, Tom is acting weird again. Like, you know, like <laughs> it's going to be, you know, all these people like stuck on a bow with a creature haunting them in the HMS, you know, the, it sounds really fun to mm -hmm. me. So this is the kind of series that uh, I could sink my teeth into. I don't know what it's going to be, but like Ridley Scott being involved is a producer. It sounds like a lot of fun. I like that it's set in the 1800s mm -hmm. with a monster, so it's just different enough. It's different enough that it's got me intrigued. So. Absolutely. And Perry, you've done some scouring on the Wikipedia yeah. page here. What, Apparently what were your findings? it's a big book, so I just read the whole Wikipedia page, and I guess I spoiled the show for myself, but <laughs> there are... Oh, oh yeah, well, I stopped. I was like, oh. Okay. I didn't stop, but... <laughs> Even though I well, know, don't spoil it for I'm us. not going to spoil anything, obviously. <laughs> but even though I know the fates of certain characters, there's just like a wealth of horrific things that happen in this story beyond the actual creature. Mm. Like very, very real, grounded, gr grounded, like very realistic things that could happen if you're on a boat and you go to this type of terrain and you get stuck. Mm, you know, see, I mean, her, yeah. it's common sense. Just think about, you know, being frozen and going hungry and all that stuff. So every little thing like that is in play in this situation. So again, again, echoing what Riley said, I don't know what they're gonna do with the anthology format, but there's certainly more than enough horrific scenarios and material to pull from. I love this idea. I am so pumped for it. Yeah. And I like Tobias Men Menzies quite a bit too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of you guys watch Outlander. Do you? Oh, I do not. I watched, I tend to only catch up on Outlander when the press junket rolls around. So it's like I fall behind and then I binge watch it all. He's really freaking good on that show. I mean, I, I don't think he really got his time to shine on Game of Thrones because he plays like like a sad sack of a character. But <laughs> in, in uh, Outlander, he is just absolutely excellent. So him leading a show like this, I think has all the potential in the world. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really excited. And I love the idea too that AMC is willing to take a gamble on a period drama with a giant monster in it. Right. That's yeah. just so cool to me. Yeah. And other horrors, Dear Diary. Exactly. Should I eat Tom or let the monster <laughs> eat him? Exactly. That's, yeah. And you're Absolutely. right though, you're right. There's so much potential here and maybe the terror will be a different name for each, you know, a different season, things that are that are terrible. Who Scurvy. Knows? Scurvy. 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 They're going to have scurvy, scurvy for scurvy. sure. A sh an orange shortage. Yeah. Um, okay. And <laughs> who, who would ever want to get scurvy? Just the name alone. You're like, ooh. That's I, why you put the lime in beer. You know, that's where that came from. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. See? Fun fact. Learn something new yeah. every day. Uh, all right. And now for a bit of fun, Fox has released a 70s style trailer in anticipation for Friday's ooh. premiere of their 10-part drama series, The Exorcist. Featuring a grindhouse style voiceover and retro editing, the promo is almost exclusive exclusively images from the pilot, but still, it's a fun little nod to the time when the original novel and film were released. The Exorcist premiere, directed by
by Rupert Wyatt and starring Gina Davis debuts this Friday, September 23rd on Fox. All right, Schnepp, I know you are a Grindhouse fan. Yeah. And uh, was it fun for you to see this? I mean, this like glossy, beautiful, hyper profile show, obviously, but sort of mixed together yeah. with all those grimy I, elements. I want the series to be like I this. Know. I mean, now I'm like, you better deliver this kind of Grindhouse flavor. Like, you know, don't watch it alone. The Exorcist. Why does he keep so the Not guy bad. keeps repeating yeah. The Exorcist? Yeah, I've been, I've been practicing. This little wharf chuckled down the voice a bit. The Exorcist. So, yeah, you know what? I like Gina Davis. I like all the the way they're setting everything up. It felt like, oh, this can be a series as opposed to like right. a one off or a two hour thing that they're stretching out. It feels like they're setting it up. So, uh, there's a bunch of possessions going mm -hmm. on. There's multiple demons. Yep. Maybe, uh, what's the guy's name? Gazoozle? What's Pazuzu. Pazuzu, right? Pazuzu. 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 I, I like to call him Pizzle myself. <laughs> but, uh, you know, maybe he's going to have to fight some other demons. Maybe it's not just one demon. So I, I'm all in. I hope they do keep this grindhouse flavor, though. Uh, Perry, how I about you? I just can't wait to hear the variety of different names you call that <laughs> throughout Pazuzu. the course of the show. Okay. Um, it felt a little like a gimmick because I guess it is, but I still loved it. Yeah. It's crazy to me how that voiceover is still so effective. Totally. It's like I know they're just doing a thing for the sake of doing this thing, but when I hear something like that, I feel the need to like go online, is this real? Mm. I don't know, it just has that kind of effect on me, but I, I'm so hyped. I can't wait to watch the show. I hope it's just as good as the imagery in this trailer, because even beyond the gimmick, this had some pretty damn cool shots and pretty eerie effects there. So, I mean, look at that. Yeah. yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I so I've seen the first episode and uh and I that's why I can definitively say that everything you see in the trailer, I'd say 99% of what you see in this promo is from the pilot. Mm -hmm. um, Rupert Wyatt is a feature film director and he's a you know an acclaimed director and so obviously there's some visual panache that comes along with having him behind the camera. Uh, but Riley, how about you? Did this little throwback little goof did that was that fun for you? Yeah, it was totally fun for me and I I'm I'm Liking what I'm hearing from from your thoughts on it, and look, I'm a horror fan, so all those images and the, and the way it's cut together, even the the fun trailer that they did throwback style, is gonna get me as a as a horror fan. But like I've said, I'm just nervous with an exorcist using the exorcist title, and 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 then he, hearing certain things that maybe is not going to be reliant on the source material, the book, the movie. I get it, you know, I, because that was my main concern. How are you going to stretch that out over however many seasons Fox wants for this? So I'm very, very cautiously optimistic about it. I'm going to watch it. Like I said, all the images, everything I've seen so far looks cool. I, when they bring in the theme, I mean, you got me. That's that's I'm easy like that. So but yeah, I, I just I want it to be good because I, I want to be able to have that that now American horror story where I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna watch, I can't wait, I can't wait to see this. So. Yeah, you know, I would say just very quickly, uh, my initial reaction from watching the pilot was, you know, cause I've, the, the reaction I had been hearing was, yeah, the pilot's good, how do you make a show out of this? Right. And when I watched it, that wasn't my reaction actually. When I watched it, my reaction was, wow, okay, this is very contained. It's It feels very classy in a way. There are definitely some small, um, intense, scares which I think lead to it really just left me wanting a lot more which I think a good pilot episode should do um, there are definitely some surprises but I will say regardless of all of that I still don't know why it's called The Exorcist I mean I just reread the book um, at Christmas time for the second or third time it's the best it's book it's such a great it's novel such a great book and, and I've seen the film I just rewatched it it was playing at a bar I was at <laughs> funny enough last Saturday night so that was for two Saturdays ago. So um, when I watched the pilot, I was like, yeah, I mean, there's really no connective tissue here aside from, you know, a more experienced priest, a younger priest, questions of faith, a family unit, sure. Mm. But aside from that, I'm just not seeing much of it. So um, I'm very excited. And as I was telling you guys off air, there was this great promo that aired during American Horror Story. Um, it was very short and I couldn't find it online. Otherwise, we would have discussed it here. But basically, it was Alan Ruck character who you know from just the synopsis he has a, a body a, a degenerative disease I don't know if we know what exactly it is but his body is certainly betraying him um, and um, 
or his mind and his body. And so you see him there, you see one of his daughters who is allegedly afflicted by the demon, and then they're on this subway car and this man just gets torn to pieces. And I was like, whoa! Because going from the, I would say, contained, classy nature of the pilot to this very visceral, crazy, violent scene in a promo, yeah. how do you get there? This aired during American Horror Story? It did. It did. Um, well, I, I DVR'd American yeah, Horror Story I, and I, I was DVR'd. busy fast forwarding, but I, I mean to watch the premiere again, so now I'm gonna have to watch well, more commercials. Yeah, I, I mean, missed it. I was let like, Let me know huh? if you guys saw the same promo that I'm talking about, because I thought it was pretty badass. But that being said, I don't know why they wouldn't have included it in here if they've already shown the footage on TV. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm rambling, but That's there right. you have it. Uh, so The Exorcist premieres this Friday. Let us know what you think of it. And now let's move on to our Monster of the Week. Ow. 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 <laughs> <laughs> ow, ow. Uh, okay, so I Am Not a Serial Killer, the third feature film from no. director Billy Bryan. <laughs> I thought, that's felt like you I were admitting it. it. I am Look, not I a serial killer. <laughs> I mean, the movie. Look, I know. Circumstantial guys. evidence. Right. That's all we're You'll saying. You'll get off on it. I can definitively nope. say. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Not a Serial Killer has seen a small festival run this past spring, as well as a limited release in the USA as of August 26. The film is released on Blu-ray and in UK cinemas this December and follows 16-year-old John Wayne Cleaver, Max Records of Where the Wild Things Are, who is not a serial killer, but he has all the makings of one. Keeping his homicidal tendencies and morbid obsessions with death and murder in check is a constant struggle that only gets harder when a real serial killer begins terrorizing his sleepy Midwestern town. Now, in order to track down a psychopath and pr uh, protect those around him, John must unleash his darkest inner demons. Based on the cult novel by Dan Wells, this twisted genre-bending thriller boasts a dark turn from Hollywood icon Christopher Lloyd and has received a number of positive reviews. All right, guys, so we all did some homework and watched I Am Not a Serial Killer. A lot of you guys had tweeted at me about it. Some friends had just recommended it, um, and so I checked it out a few weeks ago. And I, I'm surprised to say that I might have had the warmest reception to it out of our panel, but I wanted to bring it up because, first of all, you have an iconic character actor like Christopher Lloyd, who has definitely had some dark roles before, mm -hmm. but really kind of coming out of the woodwork here and doing something that I thought was impressive. But I put it to you guys, you know, let's, I want to talk about this film, this independent feature that has been getting, you know, mixed reviews, but some buzz. Where does it sort of stack up in amongst a year that is probably going to be remembered for studio horror? Mm. Um, because I like this movie a lot. I think it's interesting. I like that it blends genres. Um, I like that it's weird and I like that it's quiet. Mm -hmm. It just worked for me and I was very surprised. I found it refreshing as opposed to some of these like really glossy horror, studio horror films we've been seeing this year. So mm -hmm. anybody want to sort of chime in? Uh, I, I guess I'll start. Um, you know, I thought it was very well shot. Uh, you know, it didn't land to me. I know you're, you said it's a very, po you, you have a po most positive response right. on the panel. Um, it didn't land with me that well, but I want to acknowledge the fact that they made a hell of a movie. Um, it was shot well. It was acted well. Um, I, I, and I really enjoyed that aspect of it because I've made a horror movie and it sucked compared to this. <laughs> let, let me just put it that way. So I know how hard it is to make a movie. To do this, it is great. Now, the story didn't work with me. Uh -huh. That's the, I had a lot of questions about it. I was wondering why, you know, I was... I, it just seemed to be this small town for for as many killings as happens in this movie. It's just it seemed a little far fetched for me. It's a small town, you know. What? How can Christopher Lloyd's character kind of? Are we talking spoilers? So by the do, way, do you? We'll we'll put up Cody. Can we put I mean, up? In case you don't, I don't want to ruin it. Because because spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! Well, before we before you say what you're about to say, because yeah. I. If you read the synopsis for this novel, it's very clear what's going on. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you read the synopsis for the movie, it is not. If you watch the trailer for the movie, it is not clear exactly what is going on. And I ventured onto this movie's Twitter account and had the twist spoiled for me. What? Because really? the Twitter account of this movie retweeted somebody who said, uh, you know, I won't say what it is. I'll let you reveal it. But tw 20 minutes in, there's a big holy shit moment. And what? And they retweeted it. And I was like, wow, I really hope they didn't just 
give away a major twist in this movie. I and think they I know sure the holy did. Shit yeah. yeah. Okay. So Riley, uh, we're gonna talk spoilers. So if you want, and by the way. You know, it's nice to have this be a surprise, but as I said, if you've read the book or even the synopsis of the book, the surprise is revealed. Okay. Well, that's interesting then. I, I like this as an exercise of not, I didn't know anything other than, hey guys, we're gonna talk about this and I think it's, and, and I do, I believe it is so important to support movies like that. So I wanna go out there and say that first because it, it's blood, sweat, and tears to make movies like this and to, and to see Christopher Lloyd, again, who I think is phenomenal in this, yeah. I will say that. I just, I, it was just hard for me to f follow along with that. I just, it didn't get me. So the twist being, I guess, uh, I don't even know what you call him. The He's, book huh. calls him a demon. Okay. He's a demon. I get that. And I, and Not I like. Non-traditional demon. No. Non-traditional demon. And I get the big reveal because when that happened, I tell you, it didn't land with me. I don't know why. I was just like, okay, I could kind of see it just in his performance, which is, Weird for me to say that he's such he's so good, and then that performance, then that reveal didn't land with me. Maybe it's because I don't know. I'm used to big budget horror movies. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe they needed more money to get it in there. But it always starts for me with the story, and it, it like I said, it just wasn't. I, I was questioning a lot of it. I was like, well, okay, how is he doing this? Before the big twist, I was like, well, this old guy is killing mm. all these mm -hmm. people pulled me out of it and then the twist went, okay so i'm gonna follow along with it but the 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 main uh christopher lloyd and max records were phenomenal i i dug the premise of he's a he's a sociopath diagnosed so he wants to do things that take him away from doing something bad i love that premise but then i didn't i was wondering why he wasn't i don't know yeah, it, you can Just see. You didn't land. Yeah, yeah, I get that. All right, guys, how about you? We're always on the same page. <laughs> I, had a, some, yeah. I had a very similar reaction, and I had seen this when it premiered at South by Southwest, but I had seen it to prep for the interview, and you, like you guys know how it is at festivals sometimes where you're cramming last minute and something pops up, so I didn't really watch the movie in the best circumstances, yeah. but I ended up having the same exact reaction watching it again to prep for the show, which is kind of exactly how you felt, Riley. I can't really articulate what it was for me that didn't work. I can't say this. This isn't a movie that I wouldn't recommend for a specific reason. I think every element of the actual production is so on point and like, damn, Max Records. He's so good. Wow. He's so good, yeah. That is a very talented kid. I mean, I don't know what he's been doing since uh, Where the Wild mm -hmm. Things Are, but whatever his, uh, his track record is at this point, keep doing what he's doing, because this kid can act. Yeah. And I think Christopher Lloyd was great, too. There was something about it, and it, I think it might be, it's a very slow movie. Yeah. You definitely need a lot of patience to yeah. actually, you know, really see the fine print and appreciate what the, char the character's transformation and what he's going to and how he's reacting to all the things he's discovering. And it kept losing me in the middle where I would, you know, involuntarily catch myself, you know, like drifting off and yeah. thinking about something else. But there are moments in this movie that are absolutely exceptional, mm -hmm. like really, really tense sequences that I loved. And this is probably one of my favorite scores. Mm. I think this movie had one of the best themes I've heard all year. Mm. I love the score of this movie. But overall, it didn't really do it for me. And I had some believability issues also. There's also a couple of things that come up that are just completely dropped. Like the one in particular that really bothered me was the girlfriend, the one he keeps uh -huh. making eyes at. Like, I didn't really understand how they were feeling about each other. I think she was there to humanize him a little bit, but at the same time, it'd be like one moment I think he was into her, and then the next moment I'm like, ah, I don't know. And then there was no resolution mm -hmm. with it in yeah. the end. So there's a lot of little things like that. Overall, it's a really well done movie. I can understand why a lot of people out there are digging it. It, yeah. it wasn't for me. It sure. didn't really hit home for me. All right, Schnepp, how about you? Where are you going to come down on this? I really enjoyed it. I nice. thought it was a, a really fun, small film. I like when you said it's quiet. Mm -hmm. it, it was. It was. Like, and it sat in its quiet moments, which I, I really appreciated. I thought, um, what's his name? Max, Max Records. Record. Incredible mm -hmm. performance. Yeah. Now, you know, where the movie suffers are from some of the other actors and actresses who aren't on the level of Christopher Lloyd or Max Records, where the low budget part of it felt like, oh, we were rushing through it, or maybe those actors weren't, didn't get the chance to really get into the role. So it just felt like, I'm saying the line now. It's some of those, those parts in cheaper horror films are usually, or just cheaper films in general, if they can't get 
the time to workshop the acting. Sometimes the, the acting falls flat. So that to me, even in the smaller scenes, oh, sometimes it was a little like, oh, I wish they didn't have that person say that line. Those are the times when I came out of the movie. But overall, I really enjoyed it. I liked the weirdness that Christopher Walken's almost like, uh, not Christopher Walken, I'm sorry, uh, Christopher Lloyd had that bizarre, <laughs> like, stringlity hand thing. I was like, oh, it's like, the, yeah. it's from The, the thing. thing. It yeah, reminded right? me of The yeah. Thing, yeah. where you like had that, even with the screaming, it yep. was right out of The Thing. Um, I was with the movie all the way through, right up to the end, and then that's where it kind of lost me, is when the little like horse creature, whatever it was, yeah. like crawls out of the body. We still got that spoiler up, son. Yeah, yeah. we Letting you know. Um, but I didn't mind that it was like, I love that he was a sociopath. So the girl dr dropping in and out, it's like he doesn't know how to have a, a girlfriend. He's hanging out with that kid. He said, look, I only hang out with you so that I seem normal. Remember, it was like, yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Like, but you've been hanging out with me for two years. Like, you're just this thing that I, you know what I mean? Yeah. How he explained to the bully, like, you're just a box to me. I love the dialogue, and I, I'm sure it might be from the book, but I thought some of the scripting was really strong, mm -hmm. and you get into the mind of someone who is not a serial killer yet, but you could see exactly how someone who would think about, like, I see you as, like, I could just cut you up, you know, cut you up, and it wouldn't affect mm -hmm. me at all. It was like that line to that when he just made the bully leave, you know, mm -hmm. things like that. I thought were really strong and played really well, really well directed. The ending with the little creepy kind of horse creature, man, you know, to the director, I would have been like, dude, don't use CG, get a, a C, like, like yeah. get a practical effect mm -hmm. and don't Absolutely. make it humanoid. Just have it crawl in a corner and be this un-talking thing. And then it would have been, I personally think it would have been a really good film because mm -hmm. by having that kind of humanoid horse gray mm -hmm. thing it ruined it for me it was a cheap effect it didn't look good it looked fake mm -hmm. it, the, they were reacting to something that obviously wasn't there all those the things that are bad when people are like we'll just make it cg but you don't have the budget or the time to make it right then you have to really like really call upon yourself and your friends or whoever like get you know that's just where it fell off for me but i really i thought it was a really fun film and it's like for being like a low budget off the mm -hmm. radar i'd never even heard about it until you told me to mm -hmm. hey we're going to talk about it let's watch it made the effort i wasn't downloading as i stayed up super late watched it at like 2 30 <laughs> in the morning i was like wow this is fun it's actually genuinely creepy scenes creepy moments in it christopher lloyd the creepiest performance i've ever seen christopher lloyd it's do. really oh, yeah. so good I, would, I highly recommend it even with the pitfalls and the things that you guys mentioned which i agree with but the the other elements and moments of the film it's really strongly directed i think it's written really well there are some drop-offs and mm -hmm. you know the reality versus the you know it's a demon or whatever the stupid thing is you know what i mean it's like that <laughs> falls off to me but it's not as important it's more about like hey this this kid actually got maybe humanized and you know that's yeah. the key that's that's the thing that i wanted to bring up that i just think is really interesting is the idea that this this human child has been told you are not human you're not human because you're a sociopath mm -hmm. and your human tendencies are not there therefore you have to act and behave in such a way that is human using quote fingers whereas with christopher lloyd's character who has a wife who has a love a true love story um you know he in is our arguably more human even though he is not human yes. and so I I very very much enjoyed uh, the two of those you things. articulate it much clearer than the movie does really because I, so? I yes. got I got mixed messages on that same thing from different characters but back to the ending a little the part with the creature that threw me was its face. Right. I think we need to hear it utter that last line to really like make the whole thing come together because that, that, that's important. That's important for Christopher Lloyd's character and for Max Records' mm -hmm. character. Mm -hmm. But something about the face. Giant horse face, whatever it was. the whole yeah. body looked great, but something about the face looks like it came out of like a fantasy movie somewhere. Right. And like not a horror fantasy movie. Something no, it looked silly. like a weird fairy. Yeah. Like a bunch of really big. I yeah. got string lady arms. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any last words from the panel? Go see it. It's rentable. I say thumbs up. <laughs> okay, good. Well, you can check out I Am Not a Serial Killer. It is available on VOD, uh, and uh, we'll be out on Blu-ray and be in the UK in December. So, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, fun.
Good. Glad we talked about it. Okay, let's move on <laughs> into our Twitter questions. First up, Wayne Naylor writes, I just saw Don't Breathe for the second time yesterday, and it reaffirmed my beliefs Leaf, that Jane Levy is a really underrated actress. What other actors and actresses do you think are really underrated in the horror genre recently? Great, great crush question. Love this question. Um, I'm just going to throw out two. I've been, I was stumping for her when it came out. I just thought she was incredible, and I hope we see her everywhere else. Is Essie Davis, who is the lead in mm -hmm. The Babadook. Oh, um, yeah, I just one. think her performance is one for the ages. And also, I want to throw out Dennis O'Hare, since we're talking about American yeah. Horror Story, because mm. to, I think, um, you know, I first of all, I never recognize him. Like, for the first three seasons of American Horror Story, he would show up, and I would be like, wait, which one is he? I didn't even... But this past season in Hotel, um, he plays a transgender character called Elizabeth Taylor, and um, boy, I just thought he's he was so the heart good. and soul of that whole season. I was I was so moved by him, and I think he's very underappreciated. So those are my two. How about you guys? Jump on in. Dennis O'Hare is so good, and Essie Davis is also great in Game of Thrones, yep. except that her character got, you know, that storyline wrapped up in a way that I didn't like, but she's fantastic in the role. Jane Levy is such a good example, too, for, for that whoever sent in that Twitter question. I think she's fantastic and deserves so much credit for everything that Fede Alvarez put mm -hmm. her through. Totally. Mine goes to Pat Healy. Ooh. Why nice. isn't nice. Pat Healy a thing? He yeah. should be like a big famous name at this point. I've seen, even outside of the genre, I've seen so many fantastic performances of his. Just to name a couple things that you should totally check out. The Innkeepers, Cheap mm -hmm. Thrills, which is one of my favorite. And you know, we've covered Carnage, Carnage Park on here. E.L. E Katz is, yeah, Cheap Thrills. That fantastic movie. Just, movie. Oh, I love and it's, that movie. And it's so rewatchable. I've seen it, it like. It really is. And I'm good friends with Pat. It doesn't even matter. It's still a great film. Like I would just like say, oh, you know, pimping him out. I'd say like, man, it's cat all the people yeah. in that film are incredible. Ethan Embry. Yeah. But like, Pat, there's a good one, actually. Ethan Embry. And if you're not aware, like, because before I saw him in Cheap Thrills, he mm -hmm. was just my man from 90s movies. I had such a crush on him in Empire Records and Can't Hardly Wait. And then all of a sudden, he was that in Cheap Thrills. And he was so good at it. And now we have uh, The Devil's Candy he's coming out. smoking oh, hot in Devil's God. Candy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, all right. I'm going to give mine then to Pat Healy and <laughs> Ethan Embry for being smoking hot. All right, gentlemen. I'm gonna, I'm, you know, you mentioned Pat Healy. He's a, he happens to have a little small role in Starry Eyes. Ooh. I'm gonna give it to Alex Esso, the lead yeah, from Starry Eyes. I thought choice. she was she fantastic. Was great. And then what what other films is she in? I, you know, I thought it was an amazing debut. So I'm hoping to see more from her. Marcus Dunstan's movie, The Neighbor. Mm -hmm. She's the Ooh. lead, which just mm -hmm. came out or is about to come out. That's the one it with Billing Ball soon, yeah. as the creepy neighbor. Oh, cool. Um, well, so awesome. Alex is lead in that. And then she was in Tales from Halloween. Tales of Halloween. She was in Al Axel Carolyn's uh, right. segment. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah, that's one of them I was gonna list off. Good choice. I I'm gonna jump off the Twitter question and and go Don't Breathe with Stephen Lang. Oh, nice. totally. Mm -hmm. I mean, come on, he was fantastic in that movie. Said three words and it just conveyed this dread of a character mm -hmm. and and it's uh, how complicated he his character is in the movie and tragic as well. So. Love him. I know he's he's the bad guy from Avatar, but now he's the the <laughs> the, blind the, the blind bad, you know, doing what he thinks is right in his mind and don't breathe. And then I got to give a shout out to the little girl in Conjuring Two, Madison Wolf. Oh, she's oh, yeah. great. She was fantastic, and so yeah, I think she she's great. coming up in another movie. I thought I maybe think... was she doing another horror. Maybe I'm wrong. Probably you're gonna hit me up on Twitter and tell me <laughs> I'm wrong. So, but yeah, Madison Wolf, she was great. In That's Conjuring funny you mentioned Stephen Lang and Don't Breathe. That's that movie alone has launched. Now, next year in 2017, we're going to see a f onslaught of reality horror movies. Mm. Right. That's what all the studios are looking for now. Not, yeah. not like Supernatural or anything like that. That's like if you, so if you got a reality, not like, you know, found footage running around reality or not like a reality TV show, but like a reality like Don't Breathe, you got a good chance of selling that script. Yeah, maybe. That's what they're looking for now. Well, just like the home invasion thrillers that kind of we got sure. a lot yeah. of, now you know, it's this kind of thing, which is, so. can be a similar reality totally. thing. So, yeah. All right, next up, Alex Porto asks, do you guys have any recommendations of satanic cult movies like Safe Haven from VHS 2, for example? Mm. Great Ooh. question. I'm going to throw out an OG, Rosemary's Baby. Yeah. Um, you know, if going. you haven't seen it, watch it. It's great. I love that Safe Havens one. Oh, my God, oh, it's my favorite. Oh, God, it's so creepy. God, it's freaky. Um, I'm going old school, too. Children of the Corn. Ooh. Not 1984, right. though, so not totally old school. But this is just a bonkers 80s horror movie that I love, Stephen King, based on a short story um, by him. 
He wrote, I know he wrote a draft of the script. It's just weird. It's kind of scary. Again, it was that VHS cover, this blood red, this, the, the what do you, the sickle, sickle you know, yeah, getting the corn and, and I picked it up again. I was a big horror kid. So watch this. It's, it's, it doesn't really hold up. I will say, I know it was on AMC a few years mm. ago during Halloween and I was like, I don't remember it being that. So, and then they made 87 sequels, but right. um, yeah, Children of the Corn. All so, right. Malachi. Yeah. Even though that kid's not, the, the actor was there. Somebody was like, yo, there's Malachi. I was like, technically that's not his name, but I know why you're calling him <laughs> yeah, Malachi. Right. Because I did the same. It's the red haired guy yeah. like, who was yelling Malachi. The little tiny guy who with the Reapers had, who ran everything. That was Malachi, but everybody always calls the red-haired guy Malachi, including me. So anyway, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about Race with the Devil, Peter ah. Fonda. Ooh. And uh, that was like I've one of those films that. when I was a little kid, it scared the hell out of me. They're just people in a camper, they happen to stumble across some satanic ritual, and then they're chased by Satanists the entire movie. <laughs> it's such a, an amazing, fantastic, creepy, freaky film. So that's an old cut. Angel Heart, also a little bit less old, but still old. Mm -hmm. Mickey Rourke makes a deal with the devil. You got Robert uh, De Niro as Louis Cipher. Wonder who he is. <laughs> mm. Rolling eggs, eating some eggs, having some fun. <laughs> Satan, son. Uh, I got a couple more, but what do you think? <laughs> well, VHS2 is just fantastic. I love, I love Safe Haven. VHS2 was also in my top 10 of whatever oh, yeah. year that was. And I liked all the segments, but Safe Haven is just so above and beyond. Since you're on that, was it the alien abduction one in the I like VHS2? that one as well. Yeah, okay, yeah. good, because I love that one Alien too. abduction, yeah. Safe Haven, phase one clinical trials, and a ride in the park. Oh, my God. Oh, the ride in the yeah. park. And then nobody cares about the wraparound. Sorry, Simon. I, mm. um, but I'm going to go with something a little new. I guess I don't know if it's satanic now, but The Invitation. And it's mm. it's weird because if you had told me that eventually down the line I would be recommending The Invitation, I'd be like, hell no. I didn't like that movie because I saw it at South by Southwest last year. And I didn't like it so much. And I had an interview lined up for it that I was like, all right, I'm just not going to review it and like get all that hate brewing in my head and then talk to the stars of the movie. Since then... I watched it again and I liked it a little more. Then I watched it again and I like it a little more. I feel like that's a movie where knowing the ending helps the rest of the movie, where now every single time I watch it, I'm looking for more and more details. And I love, you're making faces at me. I just think <laughs> the reason is because I also didn't like the movie, but I feel like it's because I knew the ending from the first frame of the movie. Wow. Like, mm. so I actually have the opposite. It's like knowing the ending did not help. It's but I'm in the minority. Very many people like it. Go, Karen Kusama. We love you. And uh, she's got a new movie that she's about to do, which we'll talk about at some point. I got oh, another yeah. one. Prince of Darkness. John totally. Carpenter's well, with oh, that yeah. weird, you know, Satan's inside this viscous <laughs> fluid. They're, they're like spitting out Satan juice to turn other people into Satan. Super creepy and weird. And it's like, you know, it's got father like reaching through the mirror. All those moments are so amazing. You said Starry Eyes earlier. I yeah. think Starry that's definitely yeah, a that cult works. movie. Updated definitely. Rosemary's Baby. Totally. If you're an actress. Uh, Annabelle. Ha House of the Devil. What? Uh, which you guys yeah, like. I didn't Devil. even know yeah. how to react to I'm, that. And uh, I, The Sentinel is a satanic cult movie, it isn't it? It certainly is. With a bunch of weird yeah. creatures at the end. You got to walk down that staircase of weirdos. Yeah. So those are just a couple. Um, and if it, does anyone have any more that they want to throw? Devil's out? Advocate. Devil, <laughs> Devil's Advocate. Oh, that's oh a good my God. Yeah. I love that movie. Yeah. Drag me to hell. Come on, Clark. That, these are not satanic. Well, things. drag me to hell. This is pretty is satanic. Yeah. Is it? She's cursed. Throws nah, a curse on. Yeah, you can be like throw a curse on somebody. That's got some Satan. Okay. Action. All right. All right. And from, from hell. Finally, Josh Gabriel writes, hey, Clark Wolf, what is needed uh, and not needed for a horror film remake to be successful with critics and fans? Thanks. I have the answer to this what question. Is it? No, I don't. Who is the answer? Oh, I have an answer. Ali Sasha has the answer. Making all the monies. Don't give us an origin story of your killer. That's one of the things that I just don't like. Wait a sec. Are you saying you don't want to know about Jason's dad? Oh, geez. Is that where I was going? Yes. Jason used to work at this, you know, convenience mall. Yes, exactly. He was eleven. Please don't demystify your villain. You know, that's the whole reason we're scared. Now. Not always, and, and so it goes to my bigger point. It's all in the story. It always is. It's always in the script. Um, it's hard to remake these movies that we know so much about, especially us sitting here, mm -hmm. that we grew up on these Friday the 13th or, or what, whatever your, your du jour is. Like, I just don't want to see Michael Myers in, you know, uh, but behind the scenes making masks and, and talking about how his family, whatever. I just, like, I like the shape. I like him in the shadows and coming out and being the boogeyman that we know nothing about. I, 
for me, if they, if you have your slasher movies, which is my bread and butter, um, these slashers need to be a little bit of a question mark. Um, that's where I feel they make these errors, which the new Nightmare on Elm Street remake as well. It's like we get this whole backstory of Freddy, and this, and it goes into being weird too. It's like they actually made him. They nod to him being a, pedof- a pedophile, right. and I'm like, okay, I get it. Now he's like really bad, but there was something about the original Friday the Thir- or Friday Thirteenth Nightmare on Elm Street where it was like Freddy Krueger was a child murderer, yeah, and then they just hunted him down and killed him, right. and that's all we got. We don't know why he did what he did. Pe- a pedophile is a different kind of thing where you, you get more into the head of this person, like, whoa, he's really and it kind of up. ruined it. I think they ruined the character of Freddy Krueger a little yeah. bit. It would by adding that element where it's just a little too gross. It's a too gross. You can't root yeah. for him. I mean, no. the whole thing is, you know, you like Freddy, and right. the even though he's a horrible villain and a child yeah. murderer, you kind of there's something attractive about right, him. Right, because that kid won't stop screaming. Oh, Freddy will cut his head off. Right. Yeah, you just kind of get into that because it's not real. But like, you know, you don't want to see anything else like that sure yeah. um you know i think the key to making a good remake is is understanding what the first film was trying to do and yeah. then and then to expanding on that i think that's sort of what alex aja was getting at when he was talking about what he would have done with the friday the 13th movie had he been chosen to do it and i think you know there's a lot of movies that have incredible ideas but maybe don't have a great execution and so taking those ideas and building on them you know or the message taking the overall message and applying it to you know now or present day or what is horrific about going on now I think those are the key I think it's really understanding what this is literally what Alex said but I agree with him understanding what about the first film makes you love it what works about it and then building on top of those things but you have to have an understanding of the first film even if it's not great even if it's not successful um, in in its execution at least that's my I think a remake especially if you're going from something that's 10 20 20 30 years ago you have to look at it why was it successful Mm -hmm. in that time period and what elements of it can you take and then turn and mirror and reflect in your society that you live in now but still keep what that original thing was so those are harder things to do I mean some films are just direct remakes reboots some films try to do something a little bit different but stay within the same context of it Uh, every single one uh, has to be like I look at it like the the more successful uh, remakes, not reboots, but remakes of films are ones that mirror the re- what we're in now, but take what was successful about the old film and just kind of update it. Sure, Perry. I don't know. I'm hesitant to say this can't work. It's like when we talk about remakes and stuff on this show. Yeah, I might not want a Jason origin story, but I'm not going to go as far to say that it couldn't be done. You know, I just think the answer to this question is simply writing a good script and making mm-hmm. a good movie and you could have any idea at all, something we could never even imagine, and it could work if the movie is executed well. So I think that it's it's as simple as that. The I the, obviously the challenge is coming up with a good idea, which clearly very many people yeah. have a problem with. But I don't know if I'd want to box anyone in and say, oh, that's the wrong way to approach. I, I agree, remake. and also I mean, you could look at like Bates Motel as a perfect totally. example of like an origin of like, hey, I don't want to see the mom. Hey, guess what? You're going to see four seasons of the mom, and everybody loves it. So I mean, I haven't seen Bates Motel, but that's one an example where you could say I also think keeping the tone like whatever tone you're going to stick with keep it don't flip flop and flip around whatever the movie is that you're making if it's a remake and you've and you've like kind of locked in on the the what you're taking from the original and bringing it into the now that we're in now keep that tone you know whatever that tone is and don't don't make sure that you keep it steady I mean that's for me like a good example is that uh, I'm not a serial killer. Mm-hmm. The tone of that film kind of flip flop for me a little bit right at the very end. Worth spoilers anyway. But uh, so that's what uh, another thing I'd add. Yeah. Great. All good insight. Okay, guys. Well, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you all so much for watching. I would like to thank my panel. Perry, where can everyone find you on the internet? You guys can catch me at P. Nemiroff on Twitter and Instagram right here on Collider Nightmares and on Best of the Week every Saturday. Also, if you are one of the many people tweeting at me angry that Child Eater sold out at Brooklyn Horror Film Festival, we got a second screening. Yay! And there's tickets available. So Sunday, October 16th, 10.45 p.m. If you want to get a ticket, go to Brooklyn Horror Film Festival's website. Awesome. And Mr. John Schnepp. Hey, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. Uh, you can find me tomorrow on Movie Talk and Collider Heroes. And uh, you'll I'll be in New York at the New York Comic Con. I'm going to miss your uh, thing, but I'll be there 
from uh, the 6th to the 9th. So come and sweat it out. Wonderful. And Mr. Mark Riley. You can find me at Riley Around on Twitter and Instagram. I will be back on Collider Nightmares next Tuesday and this Sunday's Mailbag. Love it. All right. And uh, you can find me at Clark Wolf, Clark with an E, Wolf with an E on the interwebs. Uh, and don't forget to watch Collider Movie Talk tomorrow morning. Thank you all so much for watching. And until next time, we will see you in your nightmares. <laughs> hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider. <laughs>